the other chalice, the silver chalice, um, there's a there's a beautiful dancing um, image there, and that person's name is um, Garnet Camerzel. It was an actual person, and the lore of the congregation is that there was a musical event in which she start, she started dancing in ways that were astonishing because she's usually a very quiet woman, but spirit came over her and she danced like a goddess. And an artist said, we must make a chalice to remind ourselves that even that quiet piece of ourselves to just encourage it, to let it out and dance like the goddess asks you to dance. So that's what that chalice is. And it makes me smile whenever I think of Garnet and that beautiful piece. Good morning, everyone. I'm Debbie Cafazzo. I'm president of the Board of Trustees for Tahoma UU Congregation. We welcome all who are joining us this morning with a hope for peace and justice, especially for those who are bearing the heaviest burdens during this time. We're a diverse congregation that encourages everyone to find their own truth and belief. We invite all of you to join us in a search for meaning and community, guided by reason, respect, and love for each other. A few announcements to start off. Um, I am very pleased to inform everyone that TUC applied for and received a loan grant through the Federal Paycheck Protection Program. So we'll be uh, using this money to continue paying our hourly employees who are all working hard for us during the uh, next couple of months, I think. Uh, more details will be coming your way through our e-news. And want to remind you that there are small group congregational activities continuing throughout the shutdown. Um, check our TUUC webpage or our Facebook page for opportunities to connect. And uh, last but not least, you've probably all heard about the governor's outline for reopening um, full church services, gatherings of more than 50 people cannot happen until we reach phase four. We are now in phase one. So keep that in mind and we hope you'll keep connecting with us on Sundays um, until we get the all clear to be together in our sanctuary again. Um, the great thing about this virtual platform is that we can welcome people. I, we have people from all over the United States today. We've had visitors from um, England in the past. So a special welcome to all of our new friends and our returning friends. And uh, again, be sure to check us out on Facebook. There will be a video version of this service as well as other communications get posted there and watch your e-news for other uh, upcoming events. So let's prepare now to gather in worship. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be together today. Our opening words come from uh, Karen Johnson. So much time on our hands and so little in this strange time where time passes so strangely, losing track of days, slow, then fast, then gone. There are so many ways we wait, reasons bidden and unbidden, waiting while not knowing, choosing to count blessings, releasing our complaints. There are so many ways to be exhausted, stuck at home, just trying to get by without getting sick, adding our effort in service of community, living under the pall of pandemic. There are so many ways to breathe, frantic, hyperventilation fed by fear, anxiety, shallow inhale, exhale, fueled by isolation comfortable breaths from deep belly and chest expanding. Try one now. Comfortable breaths from deep belly and chest expanding, rooting us to the living earth. 
There is so much, there is so little. There is just enough. We are just enough. We are just right. It is good to be together today. I'm Janina Wright, your celebrant today. Um, and before we join me in my in the unison reading, Nancy, our religious exploration director, will be lighting our chalice. You can follow along in the unison reading with the lyrics in the chat. Please join me now in the unison reading. We light this chalice in deep respect for the mystery and holiness of life, in honor and gratitude for those who have gone before, with love and compassion for those who dwell among us, and with hope and faith for the generations to come. Thank you, Nancy. Good morning. I'm Nancy Slocum. I am the Director of Religious Exploration for Children and Youth here at Tahoma UUC. It is nice to be here in our space, wishing you all were here. This is the time in our service when we call the children forward. So I'm imagining all the kids coming forward or maybe getting closer to the computer screen for our time for all ages. I'd like to remind people that at 1130 this morning, we do a kids chapel for elementary school age children. Um, if you, uh, I sent a link out for Zoom uh, earlier this morning, and if you did not get that, please email me before uh, 11.30 and I will send it to you. I will put my email address in the chat in just a couple of minutes. I want to tell a story. It's called The Story of Grudgeville, and it was written by a woman named Barbara Marshman, who was a uh, director of religious exploration in a UU congregation. In a land far, far away, there was a wise old man, and he knew a lot because he, he learned a lot as he traveled around the world. He visited all kinds of places. And one time he came into this village that he thought very strange. And, and I'll be honest, I have traveled to many places in the world and I have never seen a village like this one. For in this village, everybody from very young children to the oldest of its citizenry, everyone was carrying what appeared to be great big bundles on their backs. And they couldn't move around very well because these bundles were so heavy. In fact, they were bent over and their, their heads were bowed because it was so heavy. And, and they couldn't look up and they couldn't look around because of these heavy burdens that they carried. <clears throat> this wise man looked around and watched for a while, and he was quite puzzled. And finally, he called so out to someone and said, my good man, I'm a stranger in your land, and I'm just fascinated by what I'm seeing here. You all have these large bundles that you carry around all the time, and you never seem to put them down. What is their purpose? And he, this young man, was all hunched over, and he said, oh, these, these are our grudges, he said very matter-of-factly. Oh my, said the wise man. That's a lot of grudges to collect for someone who's so young. Oh, they're not all mine, he said. Most were passed down to me from my family. The young man heaved a weary sigh and said, see, see that man over there? I have quite a load of grudges against his family. His great, great grandfather called mine a horse thief when they were both running for mayor of the town. Well, the wise man looked around and he just shook his head and he said, oh, you all look so unhappy. Is there no way to get rid of these burdens? And the young man with the burden on his back all hunched over said, we've forgotten how. He shifted his load a little bit, trying to get comfortable. You see, first we were very proud of our grudges, and tourists actually came from all over the world to visit us. But 
after a few years, our town became a very dreary place and nobody came anymore. And we all forgot how to stop it all. Well, the visitor said, well, if you really want to get rid of those grudges, I think I know five magic words that will stop it all. You do? The young man asked hopefully. Oh, that would be like a miracle. I will go and get the mayor and I will have her call all the people of Grudgeville together and together we can get rid of our grudges. So he went off to tell the mayor. Well, as you can imagine, the mayor was quite excited to hear this news. So the mayor sent out an email to everybody in town and tweeted and put it on Facebook and even had an old fashioned town crier go through the town and say, meet in the town square, everybody meet in the town square. And the mayor went and talked to the, town, the, the man, the visitor, and, and said, thank you, thank you so much for being here. And all the villagers came and they gathered. And the mayor said, good people of Grudgeville, a wonderful, wonderful thing has happened. A very wise stranger has come into our town and he says he can tell us the magic words to help us get rid of our grudges. And we've carried these for generation and it would be so nice to let them go. How many of you would like to be able to straighten up to have your grudges disappear, to look at the world in a whole new way. Listen to the wise words of our visitor and then do as he tells you. The visitor stood in front of all the townspeople and said, my friends, these are very simple words. Yet to be honest, some people find them hard to say. I think you have the courage to speak them though. The trick is that when you say them, you say them to each other and you have to truly mean them. I'm wondering if anybody out there listening has an idea of what these words might be. The first two words are, I'm sorry. Can you say them? Can you say them to each other and truly mean it? And the other three words are, I forgive you. Can you say that? Can you speak those words from your heart? There was a long, silent pause. Everyone bent over from their burdens. There was kind of a low grumble coming from everyone. And then finally, one person looked into the eyes the best they could and said to the other person, I'm sorry. And then more people started saying, I'm sorry. And then people were returning that with, I forgive you. And then just as the man had predicted, those grudges started disappearing like magic and everyone stood up straight and looked around and could see the world around them. But, oh, what joy. They felt it was a miracle. It was magic. So much joy. And they said, oh my gosh, it's so good to see you again. And look at how tall the trees have grown. And look at our beautiful town. And there was dancing in the streets and singing. And they celebrated. And it wasn't long before they changed their name from Grudgeville. Joy Town. I know there have been times in my life when I felt like someone has done something wrong, something hurtful to me, and I sometimes have been slow to forgive. I've held grudges. The grudge didn't appear as a burden for me to carry on my back, but it did cause a burden on my heart. And I've done things that I've need to say I'm sorry for. Sometimes I have wronged somebody. And again, it's a burden not on my back, but on my heart. So I want to encourage everyone, if you find you have done something that has hurt someone, you can speak those first two magic words. I'm sorry. It can take some courage, but it really does feel better and help relieve the burden. And if you feel yourself burdened by a grudge, 
you can speak those other three magic words. I forgive you and release your burden. That's our time for all ages today. This is the time when our children leave our service and we sing them out with these special words that I send out to all the kids who are listening. We hold you in our love as you go, as you go. May your heart be at peace as you go. To nurture the spark of your precious life, we hold you in our love as you go. Be well all. Now is the time we offer our financial gifts to the work of this congregation. Until we are together again, we are suspending our share the plate guest organizations and will resume once we gather physically in our worship space. Thank you for your consideration to support our church during these uncertain and volatile times. You may follow the link on this slide or new this week, text your donation to contribute your support for our church members and staff working tirelessly to keep our congregation connected in new and dynamic ways. Every little bit helps. And while we are physically apart, our gifts are stronger together. Let's pause now for a few moments to be quiet together, to breathe in and breathe out, to center ourselves. I offer this poem by Jack Hirschman today. It's called Path. Go to your broken heart. If you think you don't have one, get one. To get one, be sincere. Learn sincerity of intent by letting life enter because you're helpless really to do otherwise. Even as you try escaping, let it take you and tear you open like a letter sent, like a sentence inside you've waited for all your life, though you've committed nothing. Let it send you up. Let it break you, heart. Brokenheartedness is the beginning of all real reception. The ear of humility hears beyond the gates. See the gates opening. Feel your hands going akimbo on your hips. Your mouth opening like a womb, giving birth to your voice for the first time. Go singing, whirling into the glory of being ecstatically simple. Let us pause together for a few moments of stillness. Our second reading today, Reverend Barbara Child taught English at Kent State University in May of 1970. She was nearby when members of the National Guard opened fire on students. In this 50th year since the shooting, she will attend the ceremony marking this anniversary virtually. And earlier today, she began her sermon at the Kent UU Church with these words. Go to your broken heart, Jack Hirschman urges us. We who were on the Kent Commons of, on May 4th, 1970, don't need urging. For 50 years, we have come if we could. We have carried a candle in the procession. We have stood vigil. We have listened to the bell to begin tolling at 24 minutes after noon. 
We remember the sound of the gunfire. Some of us remember the sight of all that blood. And some to this day, as long as they live, bear the scars, the wounds in their own bodies. Go to your broken heart, says Jack Hirschman. And we do that. Oh, how we wanted to be in Kent this weekend. How we resisted hearing that the commemoration would be virtual. But we have been broken hearted a long time. We know how to do this. Jack Hirschman, however, has more to say. Go to your broken heart. If you think you don't have one, get one. But, well, Joe Lewis, grievously wounded by the National Guard himself, has often said, you don't have to be shot to be wounded. I think we have to hear Jack Hirschman and Joe Lewis. We who were here are not the only ones who bear the wounds of that day. The harm done here and very far from here by the university administration, the mayor of Kent, the governor of Ohio and the president of the United States. That 13 seconds of gunfire did not happen in a vacuum, but in the context of what the Vietnamese and Cam Cambodians rightly call the American War. Yes, we who he were here and heard with our own ears and saw with our own eyes and some who felt those bullets tear into them, we have memories that others do not have. But we are not the only ones wounded. We are not the only ones who can rightly claim to understand what happened here or to have had our lives forever changed by it. A few weeks ago, Barbara Child, one of my colleagues, mentioned that she wouldn't be going back to Kent this year for the 50th year and a uh, commemoration of the killing of four students on the commons at Kent State University. In a private Facebook chat, she shared some of the memories of that day in May 1970, the sunny hillside, students protesting the escalation of the war in Vietnam and Cambodia, students on their way to class, the National Guard and then the bullets flying and everyone left changed forever. Four died, others were deeply and deeply wounded and it seemed like everything changed. When I was listening to her, reading along with her, I thought of these lines from Denise Levertov's poem, Talking to Oneself. These are words in uh, a poem in which she laments um, about April as we wait for the winter to be over, feeling lost and tired perhaps, likening us to sheep being sheared as they wait for the spring that never comes. When she describes it, she says, you feel like you're walking underwater in a lake stained by your own blood. And then she comments, there is nothing unique in your losses. Your pain is commonplace and your road ordained. I found myself thinking about survival and what gets us through. See, human beings have gone through very hard times, frightening times. I think about the elder in my congregation in England um, who described to me one day uh, how it was during the bombing of London during World War II. She and her family would shelter underneath the arches of the bridge just down from their home in Richmond outside of London. When they got up in the morning, her mother would say to her, darling, run up the hill and see if the house is still there. We have gone through hard times before. And I, I wonder, I wonder what gets us through. There were a couple of things that stood out to me in Barbara's reflections on that day and her reflections about what happened in the years following. First, in what she said, is that what helped 
in the years of making sense and remembering and commemorating what happened that day, that May 4th in 1970, was learning the story about the gunfire, the real story behind the gunfire. For years, the story had been told that it was the young men who were somehow spooked by something that happened. And without any warning, without any order, they had opened fire. That was the official story. It was just a mistake. It was just something that happened. No one to blame. Only a tragic turn of consequence. The truth that eventually came out is that those young men actually had been ordered to open fire on the protesters. It wasn't a mistake or random. It was in fact intentional. And it wounded everyone who was there. The guardsmen, the students, the bystanders, the country. Seeing what is happening to us all around us for all of humanity as this virus continues to spread, seeing the failures and the idiocies, along with the courage and the dedication, the compassion, the heartbreak, the horror, seeing all of it, not minimizing, not denying, not awfulizing, but seeing these times as what they are is a part of meaning making out of it the way that we find our way through. It is surely not the best of times, but it's also not the worst of times, and especially not the worst of times for those of us who live with some stability, with a place to sleep and food to eat, the luxuries of connection with each other, even in spite of the fear and the loss. In the midst of this, keep looking at all of what is happening and know your place in it, recognize it. Second, in those years after those horrible moments in Kent, Barbara tells us that rituals have grown up around the killings. Tonight on May 3rd, as for many years, there will be a candlelight procession through the campus to the site of their memorial. And a vigil will be held until tomorrow at noon when the commemoration begins. In years past, it has been a longer processional, typically led by four people representing the four students who were shot, carrying candles. This year, it will be a single person. And standing at the memorial overnight with a lit candle in half hour shifts people will be there. A single person will stand in memory and honor of those lives. They will hold space there until noon tomorrow. What can get us through this time is also something like this. Small acts that can help us to frame what is happening around us and focus our hearts and intention. We light our chalice here every Sunday. I know many of you do the same at home. This simple act gives us a time to pause, a time to find our center, time to be prepared for reflection. We can be intentional about creating that space for ourselves too. It can be as simple as pausing in the day to pour a cup of tea and to reflect. Consider the good news and the bad news. Weave it into something worthy. There is much to be fearful about in these times, but there is also much to be grateful for. Remember courage. Remember kindness. Remember what it is to be grateful for or at least consider what gratitude may come eventually. Find that moment to pause, to breathe, to be in this time in all of its complexity, in all of its sorrow, in all of its joy.
Finally, I turn back to Denise Levertov to remind us to look forward to what will come next, because something will come next, even if it seems that this time has changed everything. In her poem, Levertov writes, as she thinks about April, you are appalled to consider you may be destined to live to a hundred, but it's April. There's nothing unique in your losses. Your pain is commonplace and your road ordained. Your steps will hurt you and you will arrive as usual at some condition you name summer, an ample landscape, voluptuous, calm, of large, very still trees, water meadows, dream savanna distances, where you will gather strength, pulling ripe fruit from the boughs for winter and spring, forgotten seasons. Try to remember it is always this way. You live this April's pain now. You will come to other Aprils. Each will astonish you. There is a next in this story. In this time we're living through though, the best news about it is that we get to make some choices about how we receive it and how it, what it might look like if only in our small lives. What have you learned that you will take with you from this time? And I'm not just talking about how to make sourdough starter, and I'm not just talking about how to communicate on Zoom. What have you learned about yourself during this time? What have you learned about the world? What do you see now that you didn't see before? What must you keep and what must you let go? Through this time of isolating and death and disease, through this time, though it may seem like it is a fallow time, it is also a time of ripening, of becoming, and of possibility. And to quote another poet, slightly off um, her own words, Mary Oliver, what is it you will make of this? What is it you will make, will, will you do in these moments with your one wild and precious life? What will you do in these moments with your one wild and precious life? I invite you to pause together in stillness. If there has been something in the words or the music today that has touched you, I invite you to set an intention for how you will carry that out into the world. Our closing words are from Jim Wickman. May our faith sustain us, our hope inspire us, and love surround us as we go our separate ways, knowing that we will gather again in this beloved community. May you go in peace and in love and in hope. Amen. And please, please join me uh, in our unison reading as Nancy extinguishes the chalice. You can find those lyrics in your chat. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And I'm going to sing the closing blessing song for you this week, give you a break from Zyreel. We'll get back to him soon. And if you want, we would be delighted to have 
uh, any one of you make a recording and sing our closing blessing song to us. Here we go. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and by this we live. Blessings on you, friends.